Episode 102 of the Highly Relevant Podcast, a U.S. Latino show dedicated to pop culture, but with a Hispanic twist. I am your host, Jack Rico, and if you are new to the show, thank you for discovering us. Well, it's been a busy week in pop culture news, and that's why I had to bring in some heavy hitters. Filming culture critic Mike Sargent joins me to discuss the Gina Rodriguez anti-black debacle that happened a few days ago, also the Tom Brokaw anti-Latino statements that he said on Meet the Press, and why M. Night Shyamalan's new film Glass is reviled by critics, but adored by fans. Then I bring in Hugo Balta, president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, to help me tackle the bloodbath that took place this past week with over 1,000 journalists, including Latinos, who were laid off. What should unemployed Latino journalists do now? How do journalism students stay hopeful of the media industry? And then we discuss how he dealt with the Tom Brokaw news as president of the NAHJ and also being a senior producer at MSNBC. We begin with Hugo Balta. Big layoffs are hitting the media world, and some of the hardest hit outlets include HuffPost and BuzzFeed. HuffPost's parent company, Verizon Media, announced it would cut 7% of its workforce over about 750 employees. And joining me now is Hugo Balta, who is the president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists and a senior producer over at MSNBC. Hugo, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, I've had you on when you used to work at ESPN. We had some really great conversations, but the conversations are a little bit different now. Um, And it's some of the key things I wanted to talk to you about. And it has to do with the so many jobs that were lost recently by journalists from uh, Verizon, BuzzFeed, Gannett, how many Latinos lost their jobs? Uh, do, do, did you get a, a sense for it? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me back. Always great to, to speak to you. Um, wish we could be speaking about a different topic, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but to answer your question directly, no, we don't have a, a specific number of, of Latino journalists that were affected in this latest wave of, of, uh, of cuts. Um, certainly, there are a few, um, especially those that are members of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, that we've been in contact with. And as it is the practice in, in these situations, uh, NHJ extends an, an open hand to those uh, who were affected by layoffs, whether they're Latino journalists or not, and we provide them a year uh, of free membership with NHJ and access to our uh, our employment, our jobs bank, so that they could be connected with recruiters and seek jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, so certainly, we're doing that this time around. But but no, we we do not have a specific number of Latino journalists who have been affected. So there's two key things that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, was one the deterioration and the erosion of the Hispanic uh, platform in the United States in terms of uh, media platforms. And then secondly, uh, my concern also is towards students that are journalists right now. They're studying to be journalists at college, high schools, and that they're interested in coming in and that they're reading about the bloodbath, essentially, that happened not too long ago. Uh, Close to a thousand jobs were lost, maybe even more. Uh, Verizon Media cut roughly 800 jobs. BuzzFeed cut 250 jobs. Gannett over 20 jobs. Uh, But more than anything, and I'll begin with this one, Carolina J. Moreno, and the reason I bring her name up, she used to be uh, the person in charge of the vertical voces at the Huffington Post, which is owned by Verizon. She went on Twitter and essentially said, hey, look, I'm no longer working here. And I, on Twitter, decided to ask her, does this mean that voces is no longer in existence at HuffPo? And she said, essentially, yes. And that was very concerning because when you look at the landscape right now, Hugo, Fox News Latino no longer exists. NBC Latino, which used to be a standalone website, it had been, has now been swallowed by NBC News. And then thirdly now, Voces is gone. And if you look at the situation of the magazines and newspapers, 
Uh, for example, the New York Times in Espanol hasn't really taken off in America. It's become more of a global uh, trade uh, platform. Um, I'm concerned about Hispanic media platforms. Should we be concerned, Hugo? Is there a problem here that we need to address and do something about? Or is everything okay? Everything isn't okay um, for all of the reasons that you've outlined, beginning with the fewer journalists that are covering everyday stories, both locally, nationally, uh, internationally, across different platforms. Um, certainly in the times that we're living in, politically and ideolo ideolo ideology, um, there is a greater need for journalists and journalism to separate fact from fiction. Um, just this morning, I was reading um, President Trump's Twitter feed, mm -hmm. and he just very, uh, as he often does, um, provides information that we as journalists need to fact check. And his latest uh, rant is about the increase of of uh, crime in Mexico and trying to build a bridge for or support for his wall and making a correlation that crime rate in Mexico will somehow affect the crime rate in the United States. Again, not using any, uh, no attribution or sourcing. Uh, mm -hmm. and, ha and he continuously talks about the caravans that are coming to the United States and why there's a need for a wall when we know that these people are coming legally to ports of entry seeking asylum and no wall is going to prevent that prevent them from doing what legally they can do. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we have fewer journalists and as you said in some cases Latinos and in some cases like you mentioned uh, verticals that are focused on Latinos like Voces, uh, like Fox News Latino before it, um, it is very concerning because unfortunately in mainstream media, English language media, um, those stories are not being told. Uh, or, and, and I should say, not that they're not being told, but not with the frequency and mm -hmm. certainly the sophistication and focus that need, uh, that, that it deserves too often. And I'm generalizing and, and I know that, that that could be unfair, uh, in some cases, but too often when Latinos do penetrate into the, the conversation, it is always very one dimensional. It is always, uh, we're talked about, but we're not included in the conversation. And that's often when, um, media companies, trip uh, over themselves or, or or put you know put their put a foot in a in a pothole because their of their lack of diversity and inclusion and in this conversation their lack of of in, inclusion of latinos mm -hmm. both in front of and behind the camera what's the damage that would be done if a lot of these uh, major in, uh, media institutions don't have latino journalists don't have hispanic platforms uh, to hear uh, or actually even defend um, when Latinos are, or our community is attacked in any way by anyone. It is the increase of, the, of a prejudiced, xenophobic uh, rhetoric by those in power that the general population takes as truth. We know from studies after studies that general population's perception of Latinos is largely based to their exposure to mass media. Mm -hmm. news, of, news and information, of course, included. But we know that overwhelmingly, the number of Latinos in newsrooms, English language newsrooms, regardless of platform, is insignificant in comparison to the population of, of journalists, of employees in news media. So in essence, we're not telling our stories. They are. And they're telling mm -hmm. their, our stories from a, from a perspective that is not our own, our experience, our background. That's not to say that a, that a good journalist can't tell stories about Latinos if they're not Latinos or, 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 or African Americans if they're not African Americans or women if they're not women. But if it, oh, but if 
overwhelmingly, if they're not, in, we, if we're not included uh, in the conversation, more and more the 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 storylines is from a perspective of someone looking at the other, and in, in, instead of producing stories that are authentic and that are authoritative, because their uh, Latinos are included in different parts of the process and content development. What can we do about it to fix this problem? Uh, is there anything that the National Association of Hispanic Journalists can do? Other organizations such as yourself? Is there anything that the common person can do uh, to, to deter this or to slow down uh, this well, issue? Beginning with the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, we engage. You know, it, it, our mission is the fair and accurate treatment of Latinos in newsrooms and in news coverage. And we rather be very proactive in engaging with media in learning what their goals are and how we could be a resource to them in helping them meet those goals. It isn't about NHJ um, being just being a watchdog and waiting for media to make a mistake and then sort of you know wag your index finger, but it's really about extending an open hand and saying we we rather have conversations that are about problem avoiding than about problem solving. And what can we do to help you in recruiting, help you in retention? help you in being more sophisticated in your coverage. So right now, at the center of the debate and angst in Washington is border security. And so it is on us as an organization to work with media in ensuring that they're not just telling the story about the Democrats versus the Republicans, but also telling the stories of, uh, about ultimately who's being affected, people, and not just the, the people that are coming to the United States, both legally and illegally, uh, for many, uh, a myriad of reasons, including uh, economic uh, and, and, and certainly violence and terror, but also about us as Americans uh, mm -hmm. living here and how that affects both people who are living in the United States uh, legally and also without documents. And so th when you have the, those relationships, it only enhances the journalism and the storytelling. Now, as a, as a, as a person, mm -hmm. uh, as a viewer, as a reader, as a listener, you need to demand better from your media. You need to engage and, and demand better and not just accept what is being fed to you. Question uh, uh, media question who the, who you're reading question who you're watching a lot of what a lot of good that's happening right now is fact checking and fact checking of whether it's the president uh, people in power but also fact checking the media and that is the responsibility certainly of NHJ but it's also the responsibility of the consumer of news and information so I know that uh, the morale is pretty low with journalists right now they don't know if they can get another job uh, at this moment because everybody's cutting, cutting, cutting. Uh, what do you have to say to current journalists that are looking for work right now that don't know how to get the next gig in journalism and media? And what do you say to students that are in high school, college, that, that want to be the next journalist? Um, as they read all this, they might be thinking of a career change. Should they? Should they stick with media? Do we need them more than ever now? What are your thoughts? Well, my first thought is there's always opportunity in adversity. And um, absolutely, more than ever, we need journalists. We need storytellers. We need uh, people with different points of view. Because, of course, diversity is much more than the optics of diversity, race, gender. Um, it's also about what we don't see, sexual orientation, religion, um, ethnicity. So I'll give you an example. I, I, you know, as a veteran of 25 plus years, mm -hmm. I've 
I've, I've gone through peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. This is a business. You know, I've been in the, in the worst of situations, having been laid off myself uh, back in 2009. Um, and I'm at a peak where I'm part of MSNBC now that's expanding news hours on the weekends, um, given the interest in politics in Washington, in President Trump. Um, but I'm also uh, a, a an entrepreneur and recently um, became the the new owner of Connecticut Latino News. The Congratulations. only Congratulations. I did see that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The only um, news outlet that's producing news in English focused on Latinos in the state of Connecticut. And, it, and it's really uh, in great part um, due to the hard work and vision of former NHJ president Diana Alberio. Um, so she, I'm just really picking up the baton. But to answer your question, there are many different ways that both seasoned journalists and students can integrate themselves into journalism. Of course, there are the legacy media, the traditional ways, uh, whether it's in linear through the major networks, including Telemundo and Univision. Certainly digital has provi uh, provided us, afforded us uh, vehicles to, to uh, continue to express different voices. Um, so it's real, again, in adversity, there's opportunity. Take a step back. Look at what you have to offer and not just see legacy media, which sometimes can be too big to navigate mm -hmm. um, and look for other ways to tell your stories, to tell the stories of our community in a way that will be profound, um, sophisticated and reach uh, a larger audience. How many times have, have we seen the numbers, for example, Facebook lives that dwarf the audience oh, yeah. for, for regular, uh, you know, uh, uh, linear newscasts. So there are tools out there at our disposals. We just need to uh, be able to use them in order to to provide greater greater emphasis to to the stories of the Latino community. And before I let you go, um, I know you're working at MSNBC. You probably saw this up close. Uh, the Tom Broca assimilation Latino comments. Uh, you were one of the first people to put out a statement uh, that you were not pleased about this. Um, as someone who is the president of the National Association and understands how important it is to have producers, uh, Hispanic or uh, diverse, uh, in positions of power, uh, how we could have avoided something like that just through conversation. Hey, Tom, by the way, we're going to be speaking about this. Maybe you're not the most appropriate person to talk about this. Maybe let's get in a Hispanic to talk about this in specific. Why isn't that moving faster? Why is that so slow? Why is there such resistance? Well, wow, wow. That's, that is a, a loaded question. Look, the, the first, it's, um, there's a lot of bias that uh, goes into recruiting. You know, um, studies show that um, people hire um, themselves, right? They're, they're, they're the, the recruiters, the hiring managers, more often than not hire people like themselves. And that could be anything from gender, to where you went to school, to where you grew up. So it's a number of things. Um, it needs to, how we recruit talent needs to change. If not, we're just gonna continue to feed a homogeneous uh, uh, working environment, both at the leadership and certainly because of the, of the trickle down effect uh, to mid managers and, and frontline. Um, so that needs to change. And it's slow moving because right now the majority of, of those in those corner offices look a lot alike. And again, it's not just about gender and age and race, but it's also about socioeconomic education, et cetera. So that needs to change. Secondly, you know, your, your comment about Tom Brokaw Look, I think Tom Brokaw or, and, or anyone of his caliber can certainly speak to a, a, a variety of different topics. And so, you know, I, I think him being part of a, of a larger discussion about border security that touched upon many different aspects about what's happening right now in D.C. with this bipartisan committee, um, he certainly has the credentials. And again, he was surrounded also, you know, by, by others, including 
uh, Yamisha uh, Alcador, who, who's, who's an African American woman. Now, yes, you're right. You know that segment would have been better. It would have benefited a Latino, from a Hispanic, right? Would have benefited from a Hispanic being included, especially because ultimately, when you're talking about border security, uh, because of the president's rhetoric, and unfortunately, a lot of the misinformation that he's feeding, it's very directed to the Latino community, whether it's Mexicans or Central Americans and, and et cetera. So yes, uh, we, uh, not just NBC, uh, but media in, in general, need to do a better job of including Latino voices, especially when you're going to be talking about a topic that is about that community. <laughs> now, the last thing on, on, on the comments of Roca, as much as you plan, and certainly there was a lot of planning that goes into those types of, of segments, you still can't predict what someone's going to say. And I, I do think that in this case, Tom Broca, as he said, was giving his opinion. The problem with his opinion isn't that he has one or that he has one that a lot of people in this country have. It's the fact that he is a uh, renowned journalist, and even in a segment that is providing opinion, he has to be fair and accurate. And he was providing an opinion that has been disputed uh, by statistics to be untrue. The truth is Hispanics are assimilating assimilating to the United States. The truth is a lar- the, largest, uh, the largest portion of Hispanics in the United States are U.S. born and do speak English, and so what his, his his comments and opinions about assimilation are just simply incorrect, and that's what what, what was the issue specifically uh, with that segment. Did anybody tell Broca that the president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists was in the building, <laughs> working at NBC? He's like, "What did you do, Tom? What's going on? <laughs> oh my God!" No, but look to 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 to, to that, I I do. And I'm very uh, appreciative to uh, to NBC management, uh, beginning with my direct manager, Yvette Miley. Look, I've been back for uh, about a month. I think this is my fourth week. And, of course, we had conversations. And to have the liberty to, to uh, as I as I. I, I have a responsibility as president of NHJ to, to through that organization, uh, continue to chap, champion for the fair and accurate treatment of Latinos in, in newsrooms and in news coverage, and really treat this situation as if, as so many other situations, um, uh, independent of it being my employer, I'm really appreciative of that. And, and I think the statement uh, and reflects that, and NHJ uh, looks forward to meeting with NBC management to learn more about this situation and how we can work together moving forward. I tip my hat off to, to, to MSNBC and NBC News as well for, for handling that really well with you. Uh, Hugo, thank you so much for the insight. Thank you so much for the words. I feel like we needed that, all us journalists, all us people that are in the media working right now, uh, to hear you say what you just said about kind of sticking together. And if it's not, let's say, a corporate media company, create your own entrepreneurial, kind of like you did with ctllatinonews.com. Uh, which is, I think it's extremely important, that sort of entrepreneurial process. Blogs, podcasts such as this one, um, anything that you can start doing your own sort of uh, journalism, uh, I think is also very important as another option. So, muchísimas gracias, Hugo. Congratulations on everything that you're going through. Um, and thank you so much for coming on the show. Gracias a ti. Un abrazo muy fuerte. And before we talk to Mike Sargent, here's a quick preview of three Latin tracks you should add to your playlist this weekend. A veces tomo por olvidarte, porque sinceramente duele recordarte. Pa olvidarte, Joe Keep Down, Zion y Lennox y Manuel Turizo. Mia, Bachata Version, J Fab y Paola Fab. Besándote, Taylor Diaz. Joining me now is Mike Sargent, a great friend of mine and a great friend of the show. Uh, you can see him on PBS. You can see him on Fox News, Yahoo Finance. This man is everywhere right now. And you know, as we say in Spanish, hasta, 
está hasta en las sopas, which Mike means you're even in my soup. Like I can't get away from you. I'm drinking soup uh, and your face is there, man. You're everywhere. <laughs> well, it's my voice. You should really be listening. <laughs> On WBAI radio, you have a bunch of radio shows. Well, you, 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 got, you got two shows now? On WBAI? Well, I, it's three, technically. I mean, I do night show, which is night shift, which is on Mondays at midnight, uh, Eastern Central Time, Eastern okay. Standard Time. And then I do my music show on Thursday mornings called Damn Good Music. But in that show, because it's I do damn good reviews. music, Mike. Because it's damn good. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, the reason I have you on the show today is mostly to talk about three topics. And I couldn't find any other person better than to talk about these topics than with you, because it's out of being a film critic, you're also a culture critic. Um, and the beautiful thing about criticism in this particular is criticism to me is the the analysis of a medium uh, and the translation to that to the wider culture uh, to understand how that information impacts us. And so we uh, owe you and culture critics alike uh, the ability to be able to understand our world a little bit better. And one and the three topics that we want to understand a little bit better is A, the Gina Rodriguez anti-backlash comments that she said last week, the Tom Brokaw Latino comments that were pretty harsh for some uh, regarding assimilation that he said at Meet the Press. This was this past Sunday. And uh, thirdly, I wanted to talk to you about the new Glass movie. Uh, pretty much reviled by critics but liked by fans because it's been number one at the box office for two weeks straight and I want to be able to understand that movie a little bit better I had not seen it so I'm glad you you had a chance to see it so let's begin with Gina Rodriguez last week (sighs) Gina Rodriguez (laughs) you already sighing (laughs) Now, yeah, I'm sorry. You're you're African American. I'm Latino, and this is the perfect two voices that need to talk about this. Last week, Gina Rodriguez was on the Sway Show, uh, Sirius XM. Uh, he's a former MTV VJ, and he has a pretty popular show. And he was she was asked a question while she was promoting uh, the Carmen San Diego show on Netflix about her anti backlash comments. What I was saying was that when we talk about equal pay, we have to talk about intersectionality because we all must rise. Yeah. And so the backlash was devastating to say the least because... Take your time. time. Take Take your time time. with it, Gina. Because... This is also my first... Okay, I got this. You got mm-hmm. it. Take your time with it. Um, because the black community was the only community I looked towards mm-hmm. growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't have many Latino shows, and uh, and the black community made me feel like I was I was seen. So uh, to get anti-black is saying that I'm anti-family. Mm-hmm. Now, do you want to take us through what those anti-backlash comments were? Uh, as a person of color, as a black person, I have views that I may or may not be qualified to have, but I have them. Okay, but um, basically, she uh, she's done. A, this is not the first time. Let, let me put that into context. This is not the first time that she's gotten backlash. You know, she she first got a backlash back in 2017, where she was with a bunch of other uh, Latinx entertainers in Hollywood with the caption is a bunch of women fiercely Latina and Latina power. And her idea and this puts it all in context. Her idea was to show, oh, look how these Latinas are all you know, powerful and they're in Hollywood. But the reality is yeah, they there's were nothing all wrong with that. Like, there's nothing wrong with that, but they were all what you might call a white representing Latinas. And they were all very light skinned and lighter than her, lighter, light as her and lighter than her. So that got her some first backlash. Right. And by then, the way, most people know that Latinos come in different shades of color that make them Latino. Nevertheless, uh, we happen to be one of those ethnicities that we're mixed <laughs> mestizos, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So she put that up. She got a lot of backlash for it because it really kind of emphasized the real lack 
of, as you said, the true Latino diversity. It's not all light skin, straight haired uh, Latina woman. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, in terms of what Latino women look like. But then her response, which has become classic now for, for Gina, was she claimed that uh, Dasha Polanco was invited but didn't show. OK, hmm. Dasha Dasha Polanco tweeted that she never got an invite. Now, Dasha Polanco is the actress, Dominican actress uh, from, Orange, from is the New Black. Orange is the New Black. Exactly. Yes. All right. So then move forward. When they started announcing Black Panther was going to be coming out, her first response was Latinas need their own Black Panther. Which and I agree. I agree, I agree, too. I agree, too. She was criticized. And, and I believe right so for sort of taking away from the, that moment, you know, you know, it was to 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 celebrate the fact that this stride was being made, you know, and, you know, uh, it, we're going to get as we talk here, I'm sure. But, you know, if a stride is being made, are you taking it down by trying to steer it away and broaden it and steer the conversation back to something that isn't being addressed or something that I you have feel a rebuttal strongly for about? That. I have a rebuttal for that. But, you know, I'll get to it. And what was the third part? All right. The third part is uh, her um, during an interview and with our boy Zilla. OK, where he's talking to the actress next to her. OK, for their role in, in Smallfoot or Bigfoot, whatever. Which is a, whatever yeah, an, an animation. Uh, an animation. She voices along with. Uh, she voices along with another, with an African-American. Shahidi. Yeah, from Blackish. Uh, exactly. Exactly. And so sh- the, the Zilla asks Shahidi, how do you feel representing, you know, black women? Gina cuts her off and says, all women. You are just goals for so many young black <laughs> women. Who just look for more, up to so many you. women. So many women. women. Yeah, for yeah. women too, but yeah. for black women, we need people on a whole nother level. And Zilla politely says, Well, yeah, but you know, black women specifically need and again, her, you know, pointing the conversation towards something, all women need representation, that you know, we should all be inclusive in some ways. Again, in the middle of someone asking a question of her colleague. Is disrespectful. Now, my take on that is that she doesn't realize, and even in her apology, what she said on Sway when she addressed it, she started crying, and then she went further once again to defend herself. And similar to the Polanco situation, she says, "My dad was a dark Latino, and his her dad was not a dark Latino." And well, so, okay, I mean, yes, yeah. he wasn't uh, of the he darkest wasn't. shade of of of. Come of, on, dude. No, but, dude. but yeah, okay. But here's the thing, though, man. You know, mm-hmm. in the same way, and this is why I'm so glad that you know you and I are friends. Uh, but but there's certain things that you might not know about the Latino culture that I've gone through. Absolutely. That there's things about the African American community that I have not gone through. But, Absolutely. But. But at the same time, I understand where she's coming from as a completely, Latino person. Completely. And I know completely. that there wasn't any malintent in what she was saying. Because Absolutely. The, it's being interpreted by a different community that doesn't understand the way Latinos have grown up in this country as well. And by the way, uh, I'm not defending that. And, you know, everybody has their own experiences. And when you get to talk about it, not everybody interprets it the same way. Yes, it is a community that may not understand her experience, but at the same time, the converse is true. What she doesn't realize is she's tone deaf, okay, in a similar way mm-hmm. that white people, white people, the best intentions, I mean, let, let's consider the cliche of the white liberal, okay? The white liberal has the best intent, Okay, and will be super insulted like she was if a white liberal is ever called racist. They're super insulted. Okay, Mm -hmm. it's like, oh, yeah, her experience, you know, being not being dark skin or 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 weight or or whatever is not considered traditionally attractive by white America uh, has given her a privilege that she I'm not saying she takes it for granted, but she may not see blinds her to a certain sensitivity that she would have Mm -hmm. if she didn't have that privilege. Mike, to me, the problem with Gina Rodriguez is there's some information gaps there. Um, Mm -hmm. But there's what what I think the, the, the crux of all this is, is the difference between intent and 
where her heart was placed and the judgment of that heart and what comes out of her mouth. There's a, a disconnect. For us Latinos, and I'm not going to speak for every single Latino, but I am going to speak to my personal experiences uh, as a Latino growing up in this country and growing up in Colombia as well, because I've lived in Latin America, graduated high school there, uh, had a life there, had a life in New York, Miami, etc. And I can tell you that even though that, yes, there are Latinos that are racist against Latinos because of their skin color, Gina Rodriguez, which, and I'll just confess this right now, Gina Rodriguez, I, I know, I know Gina Rodriguez. Gina Rodriguez stayed at my house upstate for several days, and I hung out with her for several days in New York as well because she was the girlfriend of a friend of mine. And this was before she blew up. She was still doing Philly Brown, and so I got a chance to really hang out with her. Uh, she slept over my house, you know, with her boyfriend, and we had great conversations, and I got to know Gina Rodriguez on a personal level. And I can tell you that she's not a racist. She doesn't hate black people, which is kind of what the way she's been framed. Uh, what she is doing, though, is inarticulating exactly what her sentiments are about the Hispanic community. And here's what it is. Hispanics are looking for the same equal footing in mainstream media the same way that African Americans have been chasing the same thing historically forever. Latinos don't have the historical background uh, that whites have done onto them the way they have done to us. We live in some sort of limbo area, in a gray area. And my growing up as a Latino, we wanted to be black people. Why? Because black people are the coolest. Uh, music, uh, fashion, uh, dancing, uh, acting, uh, all the arts and culture in every single way. You wanted to dress, you wanted to talk like African Americans. Uh, Barack Obama uh, famously once said that black culture is pop culture. And God damn it, that is true. And so we have always, for the most part, felt invisible in this country. Always felt invisible. The converse, I remember when Chris Rock went on the Oscars, and I've been uh, a person that has also said this as well. When you talk about race in this country, uh, and you talk about inequality in this country, the conversation should not only be about African Americans. It should be about the Asian community, the Latino community. It should be about all of us together. And we, as a Latino community, we thought that Chris Rock left us out again. And when we say left us out, he's leaving us out of the mainstream conversation. George Clooney also once said that Hispanics have it much, much worse. Because even though that the conversation is really in America about blacks and whites, what happens to those people in between that have a say, like Native Americans, who were in this country before everyone? And they get no representation. No one really talks about them. Latinos are in the same boat. Yes, we had to create our own networks because mainstream white media wouldn't cover us in any single way. So there's frustrations there on a cultural level because of our invisibility. And I've been one to always say, look, uh, the African-American community is at a pinnacle in terms of culture because they have fought so hard with the white American majority to be an equal footing. And they've achieved a certain amount of success that we as Latinos, and this is the part that I think Gina Rodriguez is trying to refer to, is we celebrate the black culture because we want to be a part of that black culture. That's flattery. The situation is when she said the thing about Black Panther, where are the Latinos? She's just really saying, look, look at our friends. Look at our friends who have achieved all this much. Why I, aren't we also a part of that success with our own stories? And there is nothing wrong about that. Again, I agree with you, but I think, again, to contextualize, I think it's it's what you said specifically, because I think, you know, Gina needs to hire you as her spokesperson. <laughs> I think I think that I think that you articulated what she 
you know, let's say clumsily was trying to articulate. And again, I, I truly, I don't believe she's racist or anything. And I definitely think her heart's in the right place. And so uh, somebody like a Gina Rodriguez, you know, can make these faux pas, okay, and then get lambasted and then still not quite get it. Right. You know, when she makes a comment like, oh, Latinas uh, are paid lower than Asian women and black women, she said that at a time when the highest paid TV actress is a Latina. You know, it's and 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 in that top ten is also Kerry Washington at the time. You know, so to not acknowledge that, you know, even though the other eight women on the most money making women list were white, to not acknowledge that or to say that it makes her come across right. And uh, I think in that particular case, she was generalizing. And look, exactly. I'm not friends. That's my point. With, I'm not friends with Gina Rodriguez. Yes, she was at my house and everything. But that well, was let's my... see if you're friends at the end of this <laughs> podcast. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. Maybe she's like, oh, you're defending. But I just want to be objective here because I'm Latino. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to protect and defend every single Latino who's ever existed, guys. That's not the way it works. We all have different opinions. We all have different experiences. Uh, I just want to make that disclaimer that, yes, I know her and I know her that she's not a person who is a racist or who intends to diminish in any way the black community at all. From my perspective, now, the things that she has done, I understand that there's nuances that not everybody can interpret correctly. Now, here's the thing. When a Latino refers to themselves and this is the part where perhaps the African-American community does not understand. And if I may, I'd like to share this story, okay? I'm not speaking on behalf of every single Latino, but I am speaking on behalf of mine. In Latin America, if you live in Latin America, you know there's racism between the white Latinos and black Latinos or Afro-Latinos. You know that. Social classes, you've heard these stories before where... We're, I mean, African, uh, uh, Afro-Latinos are completely dismissed. They're put in a particular box socially uh, and culturally. They're considered dumb. They're considered ignorant. They're considered uh, just service workers. And that's the way it operates there. If you're white uh, and part of the elite society, you hire people of darker color to be your servants. That is something that still goes on, and it's perfectly re- represented in the movie Roma. Well, I, I agree with you, and I know the experience you're talking about, not just from my, my Latino friends, and I, I can never forget going to Acapulco, and all the billboards, all the people on TV look pretty white. All the people on, on you know TV in Mexico there, but all the, the people who have the cheap cabs and all the servants and all the places, they're all dark, uh, you know, dark South Americans. But, you know, I I also think, and again, just as in a rebuttal to you, I think that that's true. But I think that in this culture, in American culture, you know, there are definitely Afro-Latinos, you know, Uh, Zoe Saldana, let's say you could call her an Afro-Latino. But you put Zoe Saldana next to Gina Rodriguez's father, you wouldn't call him dark skinned. You know, he may not be the same. You know, he does have straight hair. Don't you hair. think this is a matter of semantics? Obviously, the I, the guy I is not white, blonde, blue eyed, Mike. Yeah, but white, blonde, blue eyed is not. So, the only so way what to is pass your definition Latino. of dark then? Well, again, we're because not talking about as, me. Well, no, I, I, we're I not know, talking about but, me. But, but we're talking about we're talking about what my what the definition to anybody black of dark skin is is not Gina Rodriguez and not There's her dad. different shades of dark. Uh, we can agree upon that, right? Well, of course with there's different shades of dark, but at best there's at best, there's, I there's, would call there's him, black people that are best, light, I would call light him black. I, no kidding. I mean, I've <laughs> so, been, listen, I've I mean, does he called, not go through the same experiences a black person that a, a person of a darker shade of black mm, goes through? We're talking about, like what you said, the black culture versus the Latino culture. Mm-hmm. Black people do not have the, an idea definitely of what you're talking about. But I can tell you for, for certain, in the black culture, he would not be considered dark Right, from the okay. optics of the African-American exactly. community. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. But from our own Latino community, now, that guy called. is not considered uh, worthy of being on a novella because he's not white, blonde, blue-eyed. And so well, we're we're prejudiced against us. And I think we take that and then when Gina speaks of it on a general level on mainstream media where other uh, races and ethnicities are looking at it from their lenses, 
it doesn't look right. But that doesn't mean that what she was trying to say was in the right place. And I want to get to the other part at the press junket where she cut off the reporter, where she said, all women. Now, here's the thing. She, and this is what I took from it, and which is the reason that I wasn't, you know, uh, incensed by this. Gina was trying to make a generalization that, that, all women should be respected. You are just goals for so many young black <laughs> women who just look for more, up to so you. So many women. So many women. women. You are goals for so many young black women. And Gina cuts him off nicely, mm -hmm. diplomatically. You know, this wasn't angry or aggressive or anything like that. And she goes, no, no, no. She's a role model for all young women. When she said that, in any other time... In any other time, you would have applauded Gina for including all women. In this particular time, she's bashed for that. And I got to say, she was just trying to incorporate how in a young African-American, beautiful, smart, and talented woman like Shahidi could be a role model for all young women, white, Asian, Latino uh, uh, Middle Eastern. Why can't a young African American uh, be that? When Michael Jackson was performing in the Jackson Five, and he was black, black, not white, black. He was a role model to the world. Barack Obama. Every single black person can be a role model for other ethnicities and races. And so when uh, she said that, that's yeah. what I took from it. I couldn't understand. The, the backlash at that moment, and even though I've read everything, I've heard everybody's perspective, I know what she was trying to do. She was trying to include everyone and in how she affects everyone, not just one specific uh, I, race. I, I, I understand what you're saying, and I, and I totally agree with you that what she was saying comes from the right place. But let me give you some perspective on that. OK, the, the other side of the coin here is she did that at the expense of a question that was specifically directed towards this black woman about her representation of black women, not her representation of women. That's a, another conversation. That's another conversation. That's another question, not her representation for being for other women. She could have maybe incorporated that in her answer, but for her to interrupt. The the announce the the Zilla in this guy I call him Zilla okay because I know him right. uh, to interrupt Zilla and and to and to in in what can be perceived and I'm not saying she was doing this but what can be perceived is hijacking the conversation to steer it in the direction she wants to make her point when somebody else is being um, asked a question could easily easily be seen as disrespect. However, the intent, Man, it's, it's like... I, that to me is such a stretch to, to be disrespectful. It, 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 you look at the video, way. she wait, had wait, a wait, smile wait. on if her it, face, if man. If it was a stretch, if it was a stretch, there wouldn't be a backlash. I am not saying that was her intent. Right. I'm just telling you And I'm looking at it, it from the point of view of, of intent. Because that's, I, that, that's where you kind of have... To, isn't that the root I, of everything we say is intent? Dude, if that were the case, then then we wouldn't be living in the country we live in, okay? Because that's just not the way the world sees the world, you know? I mean, people, uh, you know, it, there wouldn't be a conflict of religions, race, class, but there is. But So I say all that to say that, to me, I agree with you. I don't think that she was trying to be obnoxious. I don't think she was trying to be disrespectful. But I think that the perception... Again, contextualizing it with the other things she's been tone deaf about, okay? If this was her first time, if this was her first faux pas, I don't think there'd be a backlash. But I think that after someone consistently does these things that offend, I think people are now on the defensive about Gina. That's my take. So uh, to finalize the Gina Rodriguez and, um, and before we segue into the Tom Brokaw, uh, on the Latino yeah, Keep in mind, just, just so you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of Gina Rodriguez. Oh, no, me too. You know, okay. I, I think she's talented. I think she's uh, also a smart girl. Um, I do think that in this particular case, here's the, here's the thing to kind of just wrap this up. For me, I've, I've known racists. I mean, if you look at Black Klansmen, <laughs> I think there's the pure evil racism, right? And then there's Gina Rodriguez, and I just can't put those two together. 
I can't. I, I, I agree with you. I don't think Gina Rodriguez is uh, racist. I, I, I think, again, just like a lot of, um, and again, it, it may seem like a harsh example, but a lot of white liberals are not racist, but they, they, uh, are, they are prejudiced. And pre prejudice only in that you have a view that is prejudiced by a, a lack of knowledge, you know, ignorance. So that that can happen. Right. You can still be prejudiced. I mean, we all are, are prejudiced about something. We all are biased in some way. Yes. Our viewpoint is biased. And I think that her judgment, not her intent, yes. her judgment. As, yes. And timing is completely, like, not good. You know what? That's, I will agree with you with that because what I will defend Gina Rodriguez on is on the intent. The intent Absolutely. wasn't Absolutely. there to offend, but it was to include. That what I cannot defend is on how she said it and the timing of the moments that she said it. And she also needs to take into consideration that the reality of the world is the one that you currently live in, not the one that you lived in before. So if in 2019, you're a celebrity and your words are being microscopically uh, dissected um, and you have to understand when you're saying it and the climate that you're saying it in, and if yeah. you don't adapt to that, then you might as well just as be wrong. But what, the nuance yeah. of intent is the one that I'm arguing because I feel that that is ultimately how you truly feel. And I felt like her intent was never to offend. I did feel that her articulation of things at a particular timing were wrong. And that's the part that I won't defend as much. And so this, this is the debacle that has arisen amongst the two communities. Well, I'd say this just to... to Add on to what you said. First of all, I think that she needs to hire Jack Rico. Okay. <laughs> second of all, second of all, I don't think she should stop saying what's on her mind. I don't think she should stop oh, pushing for inclusion. For, no, I don't think she should. But I do think she doesn't need to get on radio or media and cry about it. Okay. You're in you the had public a problem. Spotlight. You had a problem with her crying? No. I think that she needs to to if you're going to go out there and say things. Okay. It is controversial. To say any of the things she's saying. But, it shouldn't be, but it is. But how and it's, is and it's she's, con but Stay with me. Okay. It's controversial for the wrong re reasons. Uh -huh. It shouldn't be controversial because it's, uh, you know, um, you know, denigrating black people or anything. It should be controversial because, yes, we do need to keep shining on a light, uh, keep shining a light on the lack of inclusion, the lack of pay equity, the lack of inclusion of Latinos, the lack of pay equity for uh, women, the lack of uh, uh, role models, all of that. She needs to always be out there talking about that. But she also needs to then, if she's been misinterpreted, I don't think that that she should. Uh, let's just put it this way: she should be more prepared to deal with yes. it. She should be more prepared to deal with the consequences and articulate herself and not get herself into deeper hot water. Like saying, oh, Dasha Polanco was invited. Oh, my dad is dark skinned. Without thinking like, hmm, how will that be interpreted? Yeah. I mean, if I was That's in my take. if I was in Gina's position and that happened to me, man, I would have been in heavy therapy for like a week just trying to <laughs> understand right, what right. just happened. Because I know what she's telling her friends. She's like right. All I want to do is unify everybody course, and I'm getting course. completely hacked by everyone. Like what is going on? You know, and that's well, the part. Damn, where Jack, you, you sound, you sound just <laughs> like a Gina, I guess. <laughs> Moving on to Tom Brokaw on Meet the Press. Um, Tom Brokaw made some harsh comments about Latinos and how they need to assimilate a little bit better. Uh, let's listen to uh, what he said. And a lot of this we don't want to talk about, but the fact is on the Republican side, a lot of people see the rise of an extraordinary important new constituency in American politics, Hispanics, who will come here and all be Democrats. Also, yeah, I hear when I push people a little harder, I don't know whether I want brown grandbabies. I mean, th that's also a part of it. It's the intermarriage that is going on and the cultures that are conflicting with each other. I also happen to believe that the Hispanics should work harder at assimilation. That's one of the things I've been saying for a long time. You know, that they ought not to be just codified in their communities, but make sure that all their kids are learning to speak English and that they feel comfortable in the communities. And that's going to take outreach on both sides, frankly. So essentially, this whole issue is about him saying that two things here. One is that all Latinos need to assimilate. <laughs> Secondly, 
that intermarriage is a problem in this country and that a lot of Republican white people don't want brown babies? Holy shit, Mike. How does Tom Brokaw, uh, what was considered once a, an American news institution, uh, is starting to kind of show his age? I think his brain is going a little bit. How does a man of such trust in this country for so long say things like this? It was very ignorant. Um, for me in particular, what I took offense to was this assimilation issue. I'm Latino, and as you know, I'm the host of NBC's Consumer 101. I'm a regular and frequent contributor at the Today Show, where I'm not talking about Latino subjects. I'm talking about David Bowie's death. I'm talking about uh, P. Diddy, Justin Bieber, Adele. You want to talk about assimilation? Where? Do, what experiences did Tom Brokaw have that he probably sees all Latinos as like coffee bean pickers, man. You know, coming with hats, uh, you know. Uh, what experiences? He's lived in this country. He's lived in this country. Listen, the I think you hit every nail on the head. He, that He is ignorant. He's ignorant like most people are ignorant. He's a man, a uh, 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 wealthy public media, and these are his views. His views represent a large swath of white America. Yeah. I guarantee. Oh, I think yeah. he's, he's just speaking what a lot of people think. Smoking a and cigar, just, you know, talking listen, with listen, his GOP Republican like, friends. You're, you're in America. Learn to speak friggin' English. Right. I mean, he is that guy. He's that guy, and, man. And he's that guy. And, he showed and his so, true colors. Yeah, but I, I don't feel... I don't feel... That there was nothing even remotely surprising about this. Uh, I'll be honest. You with weren't you. surprised because when has he said no. anything that controversial outside of the sexual yeah. harassment? Uh, yeah, but when case? has he? When has he been unscripted? Yeah, that's true. He's always reading a prompter. Most he's likely, he's yeah. unscripted. He, this is this is who these people are when they're unscripted. This is this is you know uh, again, just like Gina Rodriguez. He's just speaking his mind. He, he's not trying to offend anybody. This is how he sees it. He's like, well, you know, uh, white people don't want brown babies and uh, you guys need to learn to speak English. So here's the bigger picture of what what that this whole story has created. Tom Brokaw, the reason he says this and the reason a lot of uh, white Republican people are also saying this, it's because Latinos are not given a chance to anchor the six o'clock newscast, the national newscast that Lester Holt is uh, is, is is doing. Uh, where's the Latino on the Today Show morning show? Where is the Latino on Good Morning America? Where is the, we are not represented. So where you, what do you think his conversations are with? Non-Latinos. Well, I, so, definitely. And when he encounters a Latino, guess what they're doing? Bring him coffee. But if we're not I'm, given the, the, the elite positions in media, we're not given the elite positions in corporate America, if we're not being given positions of power and authority in this country so people can see us in that light, then someone like Tom Brokaw is always going to look at us as second-class citizens. And I think that that is the bigger picture of the comments he made because his experience and his encounterment with Hispanics is always beneath his level. And and I agree with you. And I think that that, again, I don't necessarily see him as racist. I see him as prejudice. I see him prejudice, and and the definition explain, of prejudice. Explain like, the difference between the two for well, people that might my, not know it. In my definition of prejudice, the definition of racist is someone who specifically hates someone of another race. You know, you are against that race. You hate them. A prejudiced person is someone who has uninformed views based on their life experience. They have formed a view, a prejudicial view against a group based on the limited knowledge that they have. They're ignorant. That's why they, and they may not see themselves as ignorant, but they are. They're prejudiced. They're biased. And that's the difference between being, you know, having animosity, you know, like the people who attack Journey Schmollet are racist. Okay. Yes. The, yes. Okay. I wouldn't put Tom Brokaw in that same category. Right. Okay. I think that he was not getting on there meaning to be offensive. I think that, you know, I, I think it was CNN had a, a headline said, Tom Brokaw's not racist, he's just wrong. And he, <laughs> <laughs> is, is that comment right? 
I, I, I think it is. I don't think he's necessarily racist. I, I, I don't think I don't think he. And again, this is where when white people get called racist, they're so insulted. They don't see themselves as racist. And I don't think they should be called racist because that's a harsher term. Yeah, because they don't harbor any hatred or resentment that they're aware of anyway. They have unconscious and conscious bias. And that's prejudice. Right. Do you think NBC should fire or suspend Tom Brokaw in any way? I don't think they should fire Tom Brokaw. I think, though, that they should do something. I think that, that they need to, to, to wake his ass up, you know. And I'm all about starting the hashtag, hot, hashtag hire Jack Rico. <laughs> that's, that's my- <laughs> you know what? What is interesting is if you notice that round panel uh, that they did at Meet the Press uh, this past Sunday, yes. there wasn't one Hispanic there. And they were having no. Hispanic conversations about immigration. About, about yeah. Please, Why can't you? All the time. Oh, my God. And now, by the way, Sandra Lilly, who is the managing editor at NBC Latino, could easily be there. Maria Hinojosa from NPR uh, could be in that panel as well. Jose diaz Bolart, who's the news anchor for Telemundo 6 o'clock news uh, channel. And he's the Saturday national news anchor on NBC as well. He could have been there. Yet, they don't bring him on to talk about Hispanic stuff. Because we're only allowed to, to, to be on Univision and Telemundo and not really represent anything else or know any other topics anywhere else in mainstream America. Well, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting what you're saying. Yes, I'm with you. So I think I think that the problem is, is that a lot of these producers, either they don't know them or they don't think they're qualified to talk uh, on Meet the Press. Because of that, this is why those situations happen. Now, I do have to say that MSNBC has been doing something about it. They just recently hired the president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, Hugo Balta, which I'll be talking to him in this podcast later on, about the lack of Latino journalists in mainstream media and what we can do about it. Um, but they hired him as a producer on MSNBC for situations like this. By the way, this was in an, an NBC News, which is very different than MSNBC. They're two different camps, and they don't necessarily interact with each other as much as they should. So they're, you know, I feel that they're getting there, but I feel like these elite shows like Meet the Press uh, and maybe even the Today Show itself need to hire more Latinos as in, P- in positions of power to help. The Tonight Show did a whole Puerto Rico segment. I don't think they have a problem. Well, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned something else earlier in what you were saying here. You were saying that they don't know the people or they don't feel that they're qualified. And I don't know that that's necessarily conscious. You know, going back to Brokaw, like what kind of people does he encounter that are quote unquote on his level? He will see those 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 white Latinos, those ones who have no accent, those ones who he may not even realize they're Latino. Latino. There are a lot of people who have Latin last names that they've been so much a part of the fabric of this country that a lot of people don't even realize that's a Latino last name. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know what I mean? They're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I guess he is, you know. Dude, so and there's I, Latinos I that who that are that... Jewish with Jewish last names that are from Mexico, yeah. that are from Cuba, that are from Colombia, Argentina. Well, that's why that's why they can call immigration mm-hmm. this country crisis because they've been predicting for years that by 2050 or whatever that the country will be you know, white right and the whites will be in the minority and and you know a i think human beings are tribal by nature nature b yes. i think that any any power structure is going to fight till the end to stay in power and c i think yeah you know there there is a positive argument to the monoculture and clearly a negative one to the monoculture and 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 you know there there we've seen how that can go really really wrong and how it's going wrong and throughout history and today yeah. but we've also seen how it's needed you know, whether it's in Hawaii or, or in Brazil with the indigenous people, where if these cultures are not protected and the, this language and history is not protected, it will be wiped out. Right. I don't think right. that I don't think that white folks in America have any worry about being wiped out. You know, somebody on Facebook, because uh, I put on the Tom Brokaw um, news on my Facebook page and you can go there and see it. Um, and I had said any thoughts from you guys, and there was a one guy that said, Jack, what are you trying to do, affirmative action in Hollywood? And I thought Whoa. that was an interesting comment because I guess to a certain extent, 
I, I might be doing that unconsciously, even though I'm not calling it affirmative action for Latinos in Hollywood, but I am calling for a sense of equality. And if that means affirmative action, then I guess so. But Well, you know, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. The reason I say that, and I thought that there was something there uh, to, to, to respond to, and I didn't want to respond on Facebook. I wanted to respond here on, uh, on the podcast, is because, look, you know how you avoid the Tom Brokaw thing? By having a Latino or somebody who's very sensitive race and culture in the back as a producer. Yep. Yep. That's how you do it. Look, it doesn't have to be a Latino, but it could be a person who's white or black or Asian that understands how you need diversity in your panels. And because everything comes from almost a white perspective, this is the problems that you have of people who don't know how to speak to a certain situation when asked. There's no people of color in the back as producers or executive producers that can speak to that or make decisions for that. Uh, I, again, I agree with you 100%. And, 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 you know, tying it all together, my hope is that Gina becomes a producer and starts producing the kind of material she sees that needs to get put out there. She's doing Ms. Bala. I believe she was a, a yes, producer. I'm in seeing that. that. I'm seeing that tonight. Yeah, I'm seeing. I, I, well, I, I was supposed to see it tonight, uh, but uh, there's an Ethan Hawke Broadway show called True West with Paul Dano that I was invited to. Uh, so. Oh, so you've assimilated. <laughs> There you go, Tom. I've assimilated. I'm actually you dumping assimilated. a Latino movie you're, so I can go watch turn, two white guys on stage. On the woman of color to go watch the white guy. <laughs> There's assimilation for you, Tom Brokaw. That's right. <laughs> Hashtag hire Jack Rico. <laughs> oh, man. You nailed that one, Mike. You nailed that one. All right. Moving on to uh, something a little bit more positive. Well, maybe not. Um, but the movie Glass by M. Night Shyamalan. Uh, is out in theaters uh, right now. You can go see it. And it's been number one at the box office for two straight weeks, though it's been reviled by critics. It has only 36% on Rotten Tomatoes, while it has over 70% by the audience uh, on Rotten Tomatoes. So, Mike, uh, let's look. Uh, let's listen to a little bit of the trailer. We are not meant to have this much power. <laughs> Finally. All of us together for the world to see what we are capable of. You need to get out of here. <laughs> All right, Mike, I have not seen the movie, so I can't speak of this. So I'm going to leave this mostly to you. But why do you why do critics not like this movie? Well, you know, let me contextualize it. It'll just a little bit, you know, I'm a film critic and I got to be honest, I, I, I don't really love film critics. OK. And, and the thing is that a lot of film critics get jaded. A lot of film critics kind of sit there and watch a movie. You know, one of the things I miss and I'm sure you can relate as a film critic. One, one of the things you miss is seeing a movie with the intended audience. Yes. So you 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 have have a a, 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 a a phalanx of, of, of critics who are sitting there kind of with their arms folded like kind of all right impress me whereas you go see a movie that's with the intended audience they're cheering you know you know critics are not going to stand up and scream when in in creed when when he you know knocks down the opponent but you go to the right screening on opening night Friday Times Square it's a whole other experience so I think that certain movies certain genres, are not meant for critics. Who cares what the critics think? Mm -hmm. I think that they're meant for that experience, for that audience experience. You know, one of the great things about M. Night, when it works, okay, is that aha moment mm -hmm. is, sh is shared with everyone in the audience. Everybody in the audience gasps collectively. At the Nothing plot twist. M. M. The M. Night Shyamalan twist. is known for his plot twist, and I think he was trying what? to do one here, uh, and it looks towards the end it failed. What exactly happened? You know what? Actually, you shouldn't well, say that because it's a spoiler. I, 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 I won't spoil it, but here's what I will say. What he is doing with Glass, okay? Now, keep it, let, me, let me suffice this. Let me preface this to say that I was not a huge fan of Unbreakable. I thought Unbreakable was what? all built. Oh, Listen. man, that's one of the best superhero movies ever made. Ha. I thought it was all build up. OK, and very little payoff. But I thought it was a great setup 
for a TV series. That's what mm, I thought. Now, mm. this is pre-Heroes, pre-4400, pre-Marvel movies and the success of superhero movies. So now, 17, 18 years later, superhero movies are a thing. They, they're a genre. They're a legitimate genre. People get it. You don't have to pretend it's not a superhero movie anymore. You don't have to pretend it's not science fiction anymore. Now you can straight up say it's a superhero movie. What M. Night's trying to do here is establish his world. And he starts looking at what would it be psychologically to be a hero? Like, and, and, and how do you believe in yourself? And how do you deal with, and, and let's say you're a superhero. You got superpowers. All right. Now you're 60. Now what do you do? Mm -hmm. You know, so those are all interesting ideas. But what I do think, and this, I think, is indicative of all of M. Night Shyamalan. This is why critics are crashing it. He's not always up to the writing of some of how great his ideas are. His ideas are better than his ability mm. to turn them into a story. Mm. And I think that that's what happens here. This film has some great moments and some weak moments. And collectively, I think, because there's also a big... We've kind of seen it all in superhero movies feeling right. at this point. There's a bit of a superhero fatigue going on. Uh, you know, if this was made, if this trilogy had been done within the first five years, it would be hailed as one of the greatest things of all time. I think at this point, it just kind of, it, it's okay. But it's satisfying. So if are you, you like saying it's characters. superhero fatigue? The reason I this think, failed I, with critics? I think that this, I think it's a combination. I think it's a combination of superhero fatigue. I think it's a combination of the fact that Shyamalan can't always up, live up to his own ideas. Mm -hmm. And I also think, and again, we, you know, audiences are now used to embracing a universe. It's all about a universe, like create a universe where not just the superhero universe or a Star Trek universe or a Star Wars universe or like everything's a universe and so we get that now and if characters can come from one film to another you know even even uh other directors that even duncan jones has it, yeah. when he did the sequel to his film he brought in somebody from moon he brought in you know he, he's got his own universe going on so i think we're used to that and Shyamalan is trying to create his own but i think it wasn't impressive for critics as it was satisfying for audiences. How can critics hate it so much if all their, their main job as critics, as film critics, is to let the audience know what they should watch and not? Well, and it seems more and more that critics are so out of touch with the tastes of the masses that I'm starting to think that studios probably should start thinking about not inviting critics to these movies anymore and maybe kind of oh, making criticism at least a film obsolete what do you think of that crazy idea well i i think i think definitely some some critics i think what happens for a lot of critics is they become jaded they forgot why they fell in love with movies to begin with and they sort of adopt this like oh <laughs> attitude and and i think that they forget the the sheer enjoyment of of a of a Hollywood movie. Yes, I and, agree and, with you. And and, and so they they'll they'll really be looking sometimes for film to be more more than it than it is. You know, it's like like when they tear apart Jurassic Park. I'm a, it's a dinosaur Come movie. On. What the I, hell? You know it, exactly. Like I love Jurassic Park. What the hell is? What's the problem? You know. I think a lot of the. Uh, institutional critics, you know, from the New York Times, like A.O. Scott, uh, you know, Joe Morganson from the Wall Street Journal, Richard Brody from the New Yorker. These are elite, elitist thinkers about film. Uh, they like the art house film over the blockbuster film. They're intellectuals and they like intellectual fair. If it's not thought provoking, if it's not philosophical, if it's not extremely intellectual, which uh, with, with a sense of mass creativity and originality, then they poo poo on it, man. And I think that's wrong. Is there a problem with low brow film, Mike? Well, now you see, I think there's a bigger problem. The bigger problem is lowbrow critics, okay? Look what's happened to film criticism. Anybody with a computer and an opinion can be a film critic. You know why the mass likes lowbrow films? Because they don't understand how making a movie works. They don't know what a dolly shot is. They're just watching a story and right. they're feeling what they're feeling because of that story. 
Right, so, but that's not a film critic. No, that's uh, not a film. film but but, but, a that's, film but critic. that's what a film critic is supposed to do. It, the, 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 yeah, well, they're yeah, supposed see, to this... tell them whether they should go pay money to see. And if everything is going to be an art house film, you know, if it's going to be the Seven Samurais, uh, you can't watch movies like that all the time. There's some movies I agree are very with you. slow. Some movies are too cerebral for you to enjoy when you're coming home from work. People like escapism, and I think that lowbrow has a function among society. When you're coming back from work and you've had a stressful day or you just had problems at home, your aging parents, you've been working hard just to take care of them, you got three jobs, you got your kids going to school and you want to sit down, guess what you want to watch? Something to zone out on. And that is considered lowbrow fair. Because it doesn't well, make you think. It's not provoking as much. It's just a good guilty pleasure story. And I think that has a value in this society. I, I, clearly, as the most money-making films of all time are fantasy and science fiction, which Correct. is as escapism as you, you can get. I agree with you, but I also think, I, I, and I agree with you, I'll go further to, to underscore your point to say that, you know, yeah, a lot of people do want to just kind of check out. They want to not think about the day. That's why you know, highbrow all kind of come out now during awards time because it's going after that Oscar and that adult fair, as they call it. It's not the stuff. It's it's only, it's why the Academy's considering creating the category of most popular film because they realize, you know, there's so much out there. What are people consuming? How can we ignore a film that everybody loved but we are saying was not good enough? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree with you, and I, and I think we could do a longer show on film criticism because I had I had a conversation with uh, Francis Ford Coppola about what oh, he wow. felt. The, yeah, and, and I asked him, what do you think the role of the film critic is? And he felt that it should be uh, equal. The filmmaker should be listening to the film critic, and the film critic should be trying to understand the filmmaker. Hey, do you have do you have that soundbite? Can we hear it right now? Uh, I can pull it up and play it for you. All right, here, let's listen to it right now. So I, I would have to sum it up and say I think criticism has the obligation to teach and even teach the, the filmmaker maybe uh, the, uh, the, the era of his ways and how he could improve the next time uh, if he wants to. You know, Maybe he doesn't like the same kind of movie and the same kind of standards that you have, but I, I do think the attitude of the cr critic should be to enlighten him. Teach. Wow, really interesting, man. And uh, interesting. I, I think we should definitely talk about this a little bit more down the line, uh, especially when all the hoopla of the Oscars probably secedes a little bit and we can have more of an objective conversation about uh, lowbrow versus highbrow and the value of each in society today. Absolutely. Would love to. All right, Mike, you can catch Mike on Fox News, on PBS, Yahoo, uh, and also on WBAI Radio here in New York City. And Mike, if they want to reach out to you on social media, where can they go to? Uh, you can reach me on Twitter at uh, Mike on Screen or on Instagram at Mike on Screen. And you can find me on Facebook at Mike Sargent, S-A-R-G-E-N-T. All right, Mike. Fantastic uh, conversation. And thank you so much for sharing all your opinions. Uh, you know, I always say this. I always feel I'm a little smarter when I talk to you. So, oh, well. Well, <laughs> so thank, thank you. you, my man. All right, man. <laughs> all right, Mike. Talk to you soon. And that's it for episode 102 of the Highly Relevant Podcast. I want to thank Hugo Balta and Mike Sargent for joining me, and I hope you guys enjoyed the discussions as well. If you'd like to support the show, please spread the word on social media and tell all your friends about it. You can reach me on Twitter at JackRicoOfficial and Instagram at JackRico. Also remember to tune in this Saturday morning at 10.30 a.m. for Taller del Consumidor on Telemundo and at 11 a.m. for a brand new episode of Consumer 101 on NBC. I'm Jack Rico. See you next week on another episode of Honey Profits.